join our free WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. The test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. You will hear a conversation between a man and a woman discussing lost property at a cinema. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Good morning. Do you work here at this cinema? Yes, I do. My name's Angela. Can I help you? I was here last night watching a film, and I think I dropped my wallet under my seat. Oh, I don't have the keys for the lost property drawer. I can take some information for you, and I'll get Mr. Smith to call you when he comes in. He's in charge of lost property. That'll be fine. Uh, what's your name? Peter Simpson. Simpson is spelled S-I-M-P-S-O-N. And can you let me know your address? I live at 13 Winchester Road, Alton. And the postcode? It's W127RT. Now, I need a contact telephone number for you. I'll give you my mobile number, as that'll be more convenient. It's 01743 062 496. Thanks. Now, what film were you watching? It was the new Spider-Man movie. What showing did you see? It was the one that began at 7.30pm. Uh, do you remember where you were sitting? Yes, I still have my ticket. Here it is. I was in seat F23. There was only one other person near me in G24, so my wallet shouldn't have been found by another customer. Thanks. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, could you give me some details about the content of your wallet? Well, I had some cash, around £20, I think. Then there were my bank cards, my debit card and credit cards. Have you cancelled them yet? Yes, I did that this morning when I realised that my wallet was missing. I don't keep a note of the PIN numbers in my wallet, so the cards should be safe. Anything else? My company ID is in there. That's a card that I swipe when I go into work. I usually have my company photocopy card in there as well, but for some reason I left that on my desk. OK, I've made a note of that. Next week I'm coming back to the cinema for another film. I bought the ticket last night, so that is in the wallet too. I'm also going to the theatre, but that ticket is in the glove compartment of my car. Anything else? We've had people who lost wallets with hotel card keys, library cards, health insurance cards, passports and lots of other things. Yes, you're right. I do have my health insurance card in there. I'd forgotten. But that's it. Right then. Thanks very much, Mr Simpson. I'm sorry I can't tell you more right now, but I'll give this information to Mr Smith the moment he gets in and I'll make sure he calls right away. Thanks very much. Goodbye. Goodbye. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You will hear a woman telling some people about the organization of a conference. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15.
Now listen carefully to the information talk and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning and welcome to this first talk of the Conference on the Conservation of Natural Resources. My name is Linda. Before we start with our first official speaker, I'd like to tell you a little about the organization of the event. First of all, I'd like to tell you that within the conference areas, all your food and non-alcoholic drinks are free, as the costs have been included within the price of your ticket. All you need to do is to show the blue identification card that you were issued when you registered. If you wear it round your neck with the string provided, then it is easily seen and not easy to lose. If you do lose it, please come to see me at my catering desk with some identification and I'll issue you a new one. As you came into the conference area earlier through the main entrance, you will have seen a large rectangular room, which is the conference reception room. The catering desk is in this room, just to the right of the conference entrance as you come in. If you have not yet officially registered, you can do that at the registration desk across the room directly opposite my catering desk. Again, just bring a piece of identification. We know that some of you will not have yet organized anywhere to stay. If you'd like some help with that, you can visit our accommodation desk, which is found to the left of the registration desk as you come into the conference reception room. The bathrooms are between these two desks. We have agreed some special rates at some nearby hotels that also have free shuttle services to and from this conference center. You won't find a better deal. During the conference, there will be two speeches going on at any one time. After the opening speech that follows my talk, you can choose to stay in this hall, which is Lancaster Hall, or go to the other hall, which is Kensington Hall. Lancaster Hall, which is the one we are in right now, is through the only door in the right-hand wall of the conference reception room, and Kensington Hall is directly opposite. Plans and schedules are available on the desk on the left of the conference reception room entrance as you come in. Please help yourself. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the information talk and answer questions 16 to 20. And now, before the opening speech, I'd like to tell you about the refreshments organized for this event. In the mornings before the first speeches, we will have tea, coffee, juices, and water along with some fruit available on tables. Please help yourselves, but please don't take food or drinks into the conference halls. Just leave used crockery on the tables provided. Lunches will be served in the conference center's restaurant. To get there, leave our conference area and go up to the second floor by lift, escalator, or stairs. You will see the restaurant there easily. In the restaurant, the food will be served cafeteria style, so that the large number of people can be handled efficiently. There will be starters, soups, and salads available, as well as main courses. The main course will have two meat options, one vegetarian option, and one vegan option. There will be the usual side dishes, such as potatoes, pasta, rice, and a range of vegetables. There will also be a choice of desserts and fruit to finish your meal. Drinks are also available in the restaurant. As I said before, everything soft will be free of charge, but you will have to pay extra for things like wine and beer. Tea and coffee will be available in the restaurant as well. In the afternoon, we will serve tea in the conference area. However, if the weather is good, we will serve the tea on the terrace. Tea, coffee, juices, and water will be available to drink, and to eat there will be a selection of sandwiches, cakes, and biscuits. These will be laid out for you, so just help yourselves. If you have any queries or complaints, please come and see me. In the morning and afternoons, I will be at the catering desk, and at lunch times, I will be stationed in the restaurant. I'll stop now and hand you over to our first official speaker. You will now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. You will hear a student and a lecturer discussing a university course on coastal erosion. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Good morning, Dr. Peters. Can I ask you a couple of questions? Oh, good morning, Amanda. Yes, I'm free right now. Go ahead. I wanted to ask you about the course that you're offering next year on coastal erosion. Okay. First, I wanted to know which country the course focuses on. Well, I don't restrict myself. As we're in Australia, it's natural that I spend quite a bit of the course focusing on the coastline here. Australia has a coastline of nearly 36,000 kilometers, and around 50% of that is made up of sand. Australia provides us with so much material to work on, and is currently such a topical subject that we don't need to study anywhere else. That would make the course a little limited, though, and so we look at various other places around the world. What are some of the other locations? There are some cliff formations in California that are in danger from the Pacific there, so we look at that. A lot of the countries in Western Africa have erosion problems, and this is quite an important part of the course. Is it true that the West African erosion problem is because of human activities? It's simplistic to blame problems on only one cause, but human actions are certainly part of the problem. The removal of sand and gravel from the coast to use for construction and human coastal constructions, such as ports, harbors, and jetties, with the associated dredging required for ships to approach, have all exacerbated the problems. Natural phenomena such as wave actions, tide, sea currents, and winds also play a role. Although it's argued global warming affects these as well. Are there any other places we study? We look at some severe erosion areas around the world, so we can study the causes, consequences, and action taken in these areas. This includes some locations in the UK, Louisiana, and Hawaii. There are various others as well. Do we have many field trips? Yes, we do, but only in Australia and to places not too far away. We can't afford to go to Africa and California, unfortunately. Our main trip is a study of the Gold Coast, and we visit a number of hot spots on the coast there. What will we do on the field trips? A lot of survey work and research. Fortunately, we have the figures of previous students available, so we have great data on past erosion measurements. You'll have access to all these data, and then you'll need to do your own measurements. How long will the trips be? They'll be mostly day trips when possible to keep costs down. That will, of course, be locations that are fairly close to us here. There will also have to be some overnight trips. We get a lot of work done on these trips, but it's a lot of fun as well. You now have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Can I ask you a little about assessment? Yes, of course. The assessment is divided between essays, a project, and one exam at the end of the academic year. What does each of those entail? You'll have six essays. These will be set on different areas of the course, and they will try to make you look more deeply at different geographical locations and at the different causes and consequences of the problems and actions taken or planned. The project is for you to choose an area of study that has interested you. As we're in Australia, it's natural that most students choose an erosion issue or situation here, as information is more readily available and the locations are easier to visit. We do have students who choose overseas locations, particularly foreign students, of course. And the exam? The exam is two hours in length and will assess the whole course. Any part of the course can come up, and students will be expected to have a good working knowledge of the various aspects of the different things that they studied. How are the assessments weighted? The exam is fifteen percent of the final course grade, and the essays are thirty-five percent. The project makes up the other fifty percent. What happens if students fail? The exam can be retaken if the students fail, but the essays and project cannot be done again. It's not that easy a course. There is a lot of knowledge to acquire and synthesize. Do you get many students who fail? No, not really. The key thing for us is the student selection. We try and make sure that we choose able and motivated students. 
We check qualifications very carefully to ensure that all students have the necessary background and skills to cope with what the course demands. That sounds reassuring. I hope so. Of course, there are occasionally some problems, but usually the course tutors can see fairly early by the essay performances if any students are struggling and they try to intervene and help before the problem student situations become irretrievable. Well, thanks, Dr. Peters. That was really helpful. You're welcome, Amanda. Goodbye. Goodbye. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. You will hear part of a biology lecture on the emperor penguin. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning and welcome to this lecture on the Emperor Penguin. Penguins in general are flightless birds, perfectly designed for the marine environment. They are excellent swimmers with a torpedo-shaped body, feet and tail that act as a rudder, and flippers that act as propellers. A waterproof coat of feathers with an underlayer of woolly down plus a fat layer protects them against the cold. Penguins eat mainly small fish and krill. In turn, penguins become food for other marine animals, namely leopard seals and killer whales. On land, their main predators are skewers and sheathbills, which are both carnivorous birds that take both eggs and chicks. There is still debate about the classification of some penguins, and depending on which authority is followed, there are 17 and perhaps up to 20 species of penguin. Four of these species live and nest on and around the Antarctic continent, and the rest are found in sub-Antarctic regions. The largest of the penguin species, the emperor, grows up to 1.15 meters tall and weighs up to 40 kilograms. They are very deep divers, often diving to about 250 meters, with dives lasting on average 3 to 6 minutes. Their menu is varied and includes fish, krill and squid. A truly hardy animal, the emperor penguin is the only warm-blooded animal that breeds during the Antarctic winter surviving blizzards, darkness and wind chill equivalent to temperatures as low as minus 60 degrees Celsius. Every year around late March, adult emperor penguins leave the pack ice and may walk up to 200 kilometers over its frozen surface to their breeding sites. They require stable, long-lasting, fast ice on which to breed. In May or June, the females lay one egg and then make the long walk back to open water, eating again for the first time in about two months. In the meantime, the egg is kept on the feet of the father, protected under the layers of feathers and fat of its abdomen. During the next two months, the father fasts while keeping watch until its chick hatches. Miraculously, at that time, the mother returns with food. By that time of year, July to August, food can then be obtained more easily because adjacent ocean areas have been swept free of sea ice by strong winds. Two of the most northern emperor penguin populations are located at Point Geologie Adelie Land, and Dion Island, located on the northwestern Antarctic Peninsula. 
In this warmer part of Antarctica, both emperor penguin populations have declined over recent decades. At Point Geology, the population has declined by about 50% over the past 50 years. High mortality occurred during the late 1970s, the cause of which is not yet known, and the population has not recovered since. The decrease in the Dion Island colony was brought about by large-scale disappearance of sea ice in that region. The emperor penguin's main predator is the leopard seal. The leopard seal lives in the ocean and waits until some emperor penguins enter the water and then eats the weakest one. Also, some birds eat the eggs and the chicks when they are about a month old. Furthermore, emperor penguins face threats from overfishing and rising temperatures. The overfishing is killing most of the emperor penguin's food source. Climate change has caused profound changes in the Antarctic ecosystem and impacts the emperor penguins in diverse ways such as causing ice shelves to collapse and icebergs to carve. A recent report claims that under 2 degrees Celsius global warming will lead to a decrease in sea ice thickness and an increase in open water area. This will severely challenge around 40% of the emperor penguin population in terms of finding satisfactory nesting areas. The report goes on to say that because of this, emperor penguins will lose 20% of their number in the next 10 years. The report also calls for emperor penguins to be put on the endangered animals list. Global warming can paradoxically cause more and less ice at different times of year. Too much ice can mean that the female has much further to travel to begin to feed following the birth, and much further therefore to return to bring the food to the hatch chick and waiting father. Too little ice can mean that the breeding platforms can be scarcer or break up earlier before the chicks are ready. The report hopes that emperor penguins may adapt to the changing conditions by climbing onto land or higher, safer ice, but at this point this is only conjecture. A final threat is that the king penguin may also easily displace the emperor penguin because of its extended breeding season, which allows it to exist in areas with lower food availability. You will now have half a minute to check your answers.